So good afternoon or good morning if you're over in the um, Perth time zone. Um, to everyone, thank you for calling into our uh, webinar today. We've got some handouts uh, for in today's webinar as well. So we've got uh, a guide to publishing and um, sharing sensitive data uh, that is an ANS resource and also an ANS sensitive, it's called Sensitive Decision Tree uh, and that's a one page summary of the information that's available in our guide. Uh, so I'd just like to introduce our two guests today. We've got Professor George Alter, he's a research professor in the Institute for Social Research and Professor of History at the University of Michigan. His research integrates theory and methods from demography, economics and family history with historical sources to understand demographic behaviours in the past. From 2007 to 2016, he was the director of the Inter-University Consortium for Political and Social Research, ICPSR, the world's largest archive of social science data. He's been active in international efforts to promote research transparency, data sharing and secure access to confidential research data. He's currently engaged in projects to automate the capture of metadata from statistical analysis software and to compare fertility transitions in contemporary and historical populations. And we're lucky, lucky to currently have him as a visiting professor at ANU. And Dr Steve McGeckin is a director of the Australian Data Archive at the Australian National University. He holds a PhD in industrial relations and a graduate diploma in management information systems and has research interests in data management and archiving, community and social attitude surveys, new data collection methods and reproducible research methods. Steve has been involved in various professional associations in survey research and data archiving over the last 10 years and is currently chair of the executive board of the Data Documentation Initiative. So firstly we're going to hand over to George who's going to share the benefit of over 50 years of ICPSR managing sensitive social science data. Over to you, George. Uh, thank you, Kate. Um, it's a pleasure to, to talk to you today. Uh, ICPSR, as, as Kate mentioned, has been uh, in data archiving for more than 50 years and an increasing amount of our effort has gone into uh, devising safe ways to share data that have sensitive and confidential information. At the heart of, of everything we do in terms of protecting confidential information is, is a part of the research process where when we ask people to provide information about themselves to us, we make a promise to them and we tell them that the benefits of uh, the, the research that we're going to do are going to outweigh the risk to them and we say that we will protect the information that they give us. Um, we have a lot of data that we receive at ICPSR and here at the, at the ADA that include questions that are very sensitive. Uh, often we're asking people about uh, types of behavior that could cause them harm, that uh, we might be specifically asking them about criminal activity, we might be asking them about medications that they take that could affect how, uh, their, their jobs or, or other things. So we have to be careful about it. And we're, af you know, we're afraid that if the information gets out, it could be used by various actors for specific purposes. It could be used in a divorce proceeding. Sometimes we interview in adolescents about uh, drug use or sexual behavior and uh, we promise them that their parents won't see, see it and, and so on. In the data archiving world we often talk about two kinds of identifiers. There are direct identifiers which are things like names, addresses, social security numbers that many of which are unnecessary but some types of, uh, of direct identifiers such as uh, geographic locations or genetic characteristics um, may actually be part of, of the research project. And then the most difficult problem often is the indirect identifiers. That is to say, characteristics of an individual that uh, when taken together can identify them. Um, we refer to this as often as deductive disclosure, meaning that it's it's not obvious directly, but if you know enough information about 
a person in a, in a data set, then you can match them to something else. Frequently, we're concerned that, uh, a, that someone who knows that another person is in the survey could use that information to find them, or that there is some other external database where you could match information from the survey and re-identify a subject. Deductive disclosure is often uh, dependent on contextual data. So if you know that a person is in a small geographic area or you know that they're in a certain kind of uh, institution like a hospital or, or a school, it makes it easier to narrow down the field over which you have to search to identify them. And unfortunately, in the social sciences, contextual data has become more and more important. There's uh, people now are very interested in the things like the effect of neighborhood on behavior and political attitudes or the, ex the effect of uh, health, available health services on morbidity and mortality. Um, and there are a number of different kinds of contextual uh, data that can, af can affect deductive disclosure. And in, so we're in a, in a world right now where uh, social science researchers are increasingly using data collections that include items of information that make the subjects more identifiable. So, for example, people studying uh, the effectiveness of teaching often have data sets that have characteristics of students, teachers, schools, school districts, and once you put all those things together, it becomes very, very identifiable. So we at ICPSR and I think the, the uh, social science data community in, in general have uh, taken up a, uh, a framework for, for protecting confidential data that was uh, originally developed by Felix Ritchie in, in the UK that talks about ways to make data safe. And uh, so I'm going to go through these points, but Richie talks about safe data, safe projects, safe settings, safe people, and safe outputs. And the idea of this is not that any one uh, approach solves the problem, but that you can create an overall system that draws from all of these different approaches and uh, uses them to reinforce each other. So safe data means uh, taking measures that make the data less identifiable. Ideally, that starts when the data are, are collected. So there are things that uh, data producers uh, can do to make their data less identifiable. One of the simplest things is to do something that uh, masks the geography. If you're doing um, interviews, it's best to do the interviews in multiple locations. That in, adds to the, the uh, anonymization of your interviewees. Or if you're doing them in only one location, uh, you should keep that the information about the location as secret as possible. Once the data have been collected, um, research projects have been using a, a lot of different techniques for many years to uh, mask the identity of individuals. So one of the most common one is what's called top coding, where if you uh, ask uh, your subjects about their incomes, the people with the highest incomes are going to stand out in most cases. And so usually you group them into, into something that says people above $100,000 in income or something like that, so that there are there's not just one person at the very top, but a group of people which makes them uh, more uh, anonymous. And this list of things that I've given here, which goes from uh, aggregation approaches to actually affecting the, the values, is, is um, listed in terms of the, the amount of intervention that's involved. Uh, some of the more recently developed techniques actually involve adding uh, noise or random uh, numbers to the, uh, the data itself, which tends to make it less identifiable, but it also has an impact on the research that you can do with, 
with the data. Safe projects means that the projects themselves are reviewed before uh, access is approved at most uh, data repositories when the data need to be restricted because of, of sensitivity. Uh, we ask the people who apply for the data to give us a research plan. That research plan can be reviewed in, in several different ways. The first two things are things that we do regularly at, at ICPSR. We ask, first of all, do you really need co the confidential information to uh, do this research project? And if you do need it, would this research plan ident you know, identify individual subjects? We're not in the business of helping marketers identify people to tar for target marketing, so we would not accept a research plan that did that. Um, there's also uh, there are also projects that actually look at the scientific merit of a research plan. Um, to do that, though, you need to have experts in the field who can help you to do that. Safe settings means. Uh, putting the data in places that reduce the risk that it will get out. And I'm going to talk here about uh, three approaches. The first one is, or four approaches actually, the first one is data protection plans. So when we, we for data that are need to be protected but the level of risk is uh, reasonably low, we often uh, send those data to a researcher under a data protection plan uh, and a data use agreement, which I'll come to in, in a couple of minutes. And the data protection plan uh, specifies how they're going to protect the data. And here's a list of things that we worry about um, that one of my colleagues at ICPSR made up. Um, you know, one of the things we uh, tell people is, you know, what happens if your computer is stolen? How will the, the confidential data be protected. And there are, there are a number of things that people can do, like encrypting their hard disk, locking their computers in, in, uh, in a closet where they're not being used, that can address, address these things. And um, I think that data protection plans need to move uh, to just a general consideration of, of what it is that we're trying to protect against and uh, allow the the users to propose alternative uh, approaches rather than saying, oh, you have to use this particular software or this or that. Um, we have to be clear about what we're worried about. Um, a couple of notes about data security plans. Uh, data security plans are often difficult, partly because of the approach that has been taken in the past. Um, and also because you know researchers are not uh, computer technicians, and we're often giving them uh, confusing information. One of the ways that I think in the future, uh, in the U.S. at least, uh, universities are going to move beyond this is uh, I'm seeing universities developing their own protocols, where they uh, use have different levels of security for different types of problems. And at each level, they specify uh, the kinds of measures that uh, researchers need to take to protect data that is at that level of, of, um, of sensitivity. And from my point of view as a, as a repository director, I think that any time that the institutions provide guidance, it's, it's a big help to us. The other way is, uh, to make the data safe by making putting it in a safe setting is actually to control access. And there are three main ways that um, repositories control access. Um, one kind of system is what I've called here a remote submission and execution system, where the researcher doesn't actually get access to the data directly. Um, they submit a, a program code or a script for a statistical package to the, the data repository. The repository runs the script on the data and then sends back the results. Um, that's a very restrictive approach, but it's, it's very effective. Um, more recently, however, a, a number of repositories and statistical agencies have been moving to virtual data enclaves. 
And these enclaves, which I'll illustrate briefly in a, in a minute, use uh, technologies that isolate the data and, and provide uh, access uh, remotely but restrict what the user can do. And the most uh, restrictive approach is actually a physical uh, enclave. At ICPSR, we have a room in our basement that uh, has computers that are isolated from the internet. Um, it, we have certain data sets that are highly sensitive, and if you want to do research with them, you can. But on the way into the enclave, we're going to go through your pockets to make sure you're not trying to uh, bring anything in. And on your, the way out, we're going to uh, go through your pockets again, and you'll be locked in there while you're working because we want to make sure that nothing uh, that uh, uncontrolled is removed from the enclave. The disadvantage of a physical enclave is that you have to actually have to travel to Ann Arbor, Michigan to use those data, um, which could be expensive. And that's the reason that a number of repositories are turning to virtual data enclaves. This is a, a sort of a sketch of what the technology looks like. What happens is that you as a, as a researcher uh, look over the internet log on to a site that connects you to uh, a virtual computer and then that virtual computer is in uh, contact uh, is has access to the data but your desktop machine does not you only can access the data through the the, the uh, virtual machine at icpsr we actually use this system internally for our data processing to provide a, an additional level of security. So we talk about the virtual data enclave, which is the service we provide to, to researchers, and the secure data environment, which is where our, our staff works when they're working on, on sensitive data. And um, it's a little bit of, uh, of a letdown, but this is what it actually looks like. Uh, what I've done here is uh, the window that's open there with the blue background is the uh, our virtual data enclave and I've opened a, a window for Stata inside there. The black background is my desktop computer and which if you look closely you'll see in the corner of the the blue box that you see the the usual Windows uh, icons and that's because when you're operating remotely on in the virtual enclave you're using Windows and it looks just like Windows and and acts just like Windows, except that you can't get to anything uh, on the internet. Uh, you can only get, get to things that uh, we provide for a level of security. On top of that, the uh, software that's used, and, and uh, we use VMware software, but there are other br uh, brands uh, that do the same thing, um, essentially turns off your access to your printer, turns off uh, your access to your uh, hard drive or USB drive, so you cannot copy uh, data from the, the uh, virtual machine to your local machine. You can uh, take a picture of what you see there, but um, uh, that, and because the, you have that capability, you, we also restrict people with uh, data use agreements. And that's my next topic. How do you make people safer? Well, the main way that we make people safer is by making them sign data use agreements or by providing them training. Um, the data use agreements used at ICPSR are, are frankly rather complicated. They consist of a research plan, as I mentioned before. We require people to get IRB approval for what they're doing, a data protection plan, which I mentioned. And then there are these additional things of behavioral rules and security pledges and an institutional signature, which I'll mention now. So the process, if you look at the overall process of doing research, there are a number of legal agreements that get passed back and forth. It actually starts with an agreement made between the data collectors and the subject in which they provide the subjects with informed consent about what the research is about and, and what they're going to be asked. And it's only after that that the data go from the subject to the data producers. 
then um, the data archive, uh, such as ICPSR or, or ADA, actually reaches an, an agreement with the data producers um, in which we become their delegates for distributing the, the data. And that's another legal agreement. And then when the data are sensitive, we actually uh, reach, uh, have to get an agreement from the researcher, and these are pieces of information we get from the researcher. And in the United States, uh, our system is that the agreement is, is actually not with the researcher, but with the researcher's uh, institution. So at ICPSR, we're located at the University of Michigan, and all of our data use agreements are between the University of Michigan and, and uh, some other univers university. Uh, in most cases, there, there are some exceptions. So it's only after we get all of these uh, legal agreements in place that the researcher uh, gets the data. Um, one of the things in our agreements at ICPSR is a list of the types of things that we don't want people to do with the data. So for example, we don't want someone to publish a table, a cross-tabulation table, where uh, there's one cell that has uh, you know, one person in it because that makes that person more identifiable. And there are num there's a list of these things. I think uh, often we have like 10 or, tw 10 or 12 of them that are really standard rules of thumb that statisticians have developed for controlling re-identification. Um, the ICPSR agreements are also, as I said, agreements between institutions. And one of the things that we require is that the institution takes responsibility for enforcing them. And that if we at ICPSR believe that something has gone wrong, the agreement, the ins institution agrees that they will investigate this based on their own policies about uh, scientific integrity and protecting uh, research subjects. Um, DOAs are not ideal. They're actually there's a lot of friction in the system. Um, what, currently, in most cases, uh, a PI needs a different data use agreement for every data set, and they don't like that. We can, I think, in the future, reduce the cost of data use agreements by making institution-wide agreements where the institution designates uh, a steward who will uh, work with uh, researchers at that institution um, and there's already an example of this, the Databury project, which is a project in developmental psychology that shares videos, has done very good work on legal agreements. And uh, my colleague, uh, the current director at uh, ICPSR, Margaret Levenstein, has been working on a, on a model where a researcher who gets a uh, data use agreement from one data set can use that to get a, a data use agreement for another data set so that individuals can be certified and, and, and include that certification in, in other uh, places. Um, one of the things that I think we need to do more about is training uh, a number of places like ADA, train people who get confidential data. Um, we've actually done some work on developing an online tutorial about disclosure risk, which, which uh, we haven't yet released, but it's, I think, something that should be done. Finally, there's safe outputs. Uh, one of the, the, uh, the last stage in the process is that uh, the repository can review what was done with the data and remove things that are a risk to subjects. Um, this only works if you retain control, so it doesn't work if you send the data to the researcher, but it does work if you're using uh, one of these remote systems like remote submission or a virtual uh, data enclave. Um, often this kind of checking is costly. There are some ways to automate part of it, but uh, a, a manual review is, is almost always necessary in the end. Uh, so a, a last thing about the costs and benefits. Obviously, data protection has costs. Modifying data affects the analysis. 
um, if you restrict access, you're imposing burdens on researchers. And our view is that you need to weigh the, the, the costs with the risks that are involved. And there are two dimensions of risk. One dimension is, in this particular data set, what's the likelihood that an individual could be re-identified if someone tried to do it? And secondly, if that person was re-identified, what harm would result? So we think about this as a matrix where you can see in this uh, figure, uh, as you move up, you're getting more harm. As you move to the right, you're increasing the probability of disclosure. So if the data set is, um, is low on both of these things, you know, for example, if it's a, if it's a national survey um, where a thousand people from all over the United States were interviewed and we don't know where they're from and we ask them what their favorite brand of refrigerator is, um, that kind of data we're happy to uh, send out directly um, over the web without a data use agreement with a, the with a simple terms of use. But as we get more complex data with more questions, more sensitive questions, um, we often will add uh, some requirements in the form of a data use agreement to assure that data are protected. And when we get to complex data where uh, there is a, 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 a strong possibility of re-identification and where some harm would result to the subjects, um, we, in that case, we often add a technology component like the virtual data enclave. And then there are the really uh, seriously uh, risky and sensitive things. Uh, my usual example of this is we have a data set at ICPSR that was compiled from interviews with uh, convicts about um, sexual abuse and other kinds of abuse in prisons. And that data is very easy to identify and very sensitive. And we only provide that in, in our uh, physical uh, data center. So um, that's the end of my presentation. And I uh, thank you for the, your attention. And we'll take quest questions later. Great. Thank you, George. So we'll pass over to um, Dr. Steve McGeckin um, to give his presentation about managing sensitive data at the Australian Data Archive. OK. Um, so uh, my aim today is to sort of build off what George has talked about, um, particularly taking the five safes model and looking at what the situation is in the Australian case. Now, I'll talk about the Australian Data Archive and how we support sensitive data, but I want to put it in the context of the, the broader framework of how we access sensitive data in, uh, in Australian social sciences generally. Um, so I'm going to talk um, about some of the, the different options that are around sort of picking up on um, some of what George has discussed in terms of some of the alternatives that are available and sort of demonstrate the, you know, the different ways these are in use here in Australia. Um, so I'm really focusing more on the five safes model and its application in Australia than I am specifically on the, the on ADA. Um, as I would say, we are one component of the, the broader framework for sensitive data access here. Um, so just to say, I mean, I, what I really wanted to cover off here is thinking about um, uh, sensitive data and the, the five safes model. I'll look at the different frameworks for sensitive data access in Australia and where you might find them, and, and then how we apply the five safes model um, at ADA in, in particular, uh, and then depending on time I might say something briefly about the, the data life cycle and sensitive data um, uh, as, as we go through. So I, I wanted to just pick up on the, particularly the ANS definition here of sensitive data um, and I say, uh, I'll, I'll frame this in the, in the context of um, most of what we deal with um, at, the, at ADA at some point in its life cycle has been sensitive data. It's more often that it's, it's information that's collected from humans, um, often you know, um, with some degree of identifiability, at least at the point of data collection, not necessarily at the point of distribution. Um, uh, so a lot of what we deal with, um, and this is, this is true for a lot of um, social science archives, has been subject to, you know, it would fall into the class of sensitive data. 
Um, but there's a distinction there between what we get and what we distribute um, that we would probably um, draw, um, uh, draw a distinction. So, so in terms of our, our definition here, is this is the handout I think that's in um, uh, the, the handout section uh, and it's available online. Um, data that can be used to identify an individual species, object, process or location that introduces a risk of discrimination, harm or unwanted attention. Um, now we tend to think in terms of human risks um, uh, more than anything else, to say the, the, the risks to, to humans and, and, indiv and individuals. Um, but it does apply in other cases as well. Uh, so, for example, the identification of um, uh, sites for Indigenous art um, might in and of itself lead more people to um, want to go and visit that location and, you know, in a sense destroy the thing that you're actually trying to protect. Um, so the more visits that you actually get, the, the, the more degraded the art itself becomes. So it doesn't just hold for, you know, human research, but that's, you know, probably our priority, you know, our emphasis at, at ADA. Um, so just, just to reiter reiterate the, um, the five safes <laughs> again, so we talk about five things, people, projects, settings, data and outputs. Um, and the, the, the reference here is so, um, down at the bottom, you can sort of look at the, the document that Felix Ritchie and uh, two of his colleagues um, developed, sort of framing out the, um, the five safes model. Um, what I would say about this is say it's been adopted you know, um, directly with our, our UK uh, data service. Um, that's where it has its origins. Um, the, the basic principles are, are applied in a lot of the social science data archives and it's now actually been adopted by the Australian Bureau of Statistics as well. Uh, so their framework for thinking about output of um, uh, different types of publications, um, you know, literally leverages this, this, this model. Uh, so we, might, we think it's a quite a useful you know, sort of framework for, for talking about. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to George in thinking about how we think about what we're worried about. Um, and, and I'm going to take, you know, as a depositor, you're worried about, you know, the, the risk of disclosure. As a researcher, what, well, what's the flip side of that? Um, why do we need access to sensitive data? You know, what does it provide? Um, now, the National Science Foundation, about four or five years ago, um, put out a call uh, around um, how, do, how could we improve access to uh, microdata, particularly from government sources, uh, and it sort of highlights, you know, the sorts of things um, why we we talk about um, the need for access is it, it the sorts of research you can do. Um, the uh, and this this comes from a submission from David Card, Raj Shetty, and, uh, and and several economists in uh, in the the US uh, and elsewhere. Um, they were highlighting, well, you know, what what's needed. Direct access is really the, you know the, the critical thing here. Uh, and direct access to microdata, and by microdata we mean individual informa information about individuals line by line. Aggregate statistics, um, synthetic data, you can create you know, fake people as it were, or submission of uh, computer programs for someone else to run, really don't allow you to, to do the sorts of work you need um, to answer policy questions in particular. Um, and a lot of the, you know, particularly social policy research, is focused in this way. So. In order to do certain things, access to this, this data is, is necessary. And so what, you know, how do we facilitate that, taking account of the sorts of concerns that have been raised? Alongside that is, well, how do people expect to access it? Um, this was an interesting um, uh, blog post from uh, a researcher based at the, previously at the University of Canterbury, um, comparing um, how you access US census data versus the New Zealand census and similarly um, we, could, we could say the same with the, um, the Australian census as well. In the US, you can get a 1% sample of the census, and you just go and download a file directly. It's open um, as what's called a public use micro sample file. And you know, those are directly available. Um, in New Zealand, there's a whole series of instructions you have to go through. You might be subject to um, data use agreements. You might be subject to an application process, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now he's criticising, saying it, it must be much, it should be much easier. It should be the US model that's the appropriate here, rather than the um, uh, than the, the New Zealand model. But what we're really, you know, probably talking about here is, well, the both are appropriate depending upon the sorts of detail, the sorts of identifying information that are available. Both might be, you know, valid models. They just allow you to do different things. Uh, the first model really focuses on, in a sense. Um, 
masking the data to some degree in some of the, the safe data models that, um, that George talked about. The other uses other types of aspects of the safe, you know, the safe model to um, to address confidentiality concerns. Um, and what you'll also find is researchers understand these. You know that there has to be some trade-offs. So, you know the, the, the recognition of the need for confidentiality is you know, is recognised and, and, and understood, and that, that there may well be, and there, you know, there, there ought to be trade-offs in return for that. So, you know, for example, um, Card and his colleagues suggest that, well, here's you know, a set of criteria that you could put in place for enabling one access, you know, form of access to, uh, to microdata, uh, to sensitive microdata. Uh, and it might, you know, they reference you know, access through local statistical offices, through some re remote connections, such as the virtual enclave that, that, that George talked about, uh, and monitoring of what people are doing. If you're going to have highly sensitive data available, the trade-off for that for access should be you know, appropriate monitoring. Um, so there is a recognition that the, you know, these, um, they, I mean, this is just one possible approach, but a recognition that, you know, that um, access brings with it responsibilities and you know, appropriate checks and balances. So what I wanted to talk about is, well, how is that eventuated in Australia? Um, what what do we see? So this button here. Uh, so the sorts of models that we see here in Australia, I've I've, I've broken them out here broadly. I so say I think we can you know look at you know, sort of four broad areas. Um, the one that people are probably most familiar with um, is the ABS, the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Um, they have a number of um, systems and uh, access methods that suit different types of um, safe profiles. Um, so these include uh, what's called confidentialized unit record files um, uh, or CURFs. Um, uh, the uh, what they have the remote access data lab, um, which is one of their online execution systems. They have an on-site data lab. You can go to uh, the bowels of the um, the ABS um, buildings in certainly in Canberra and I believe in other states as well. And do on-site processing. And then they have other other systems. Probably the best known of these is what's called Table Builder, um, which is an online data uh, aggregation tool which does safe data processing uh, on the fly. Um, our emphasis at ADA is primarily on what these confidentialized unit record files. So we provide unit record access um, and some aggregated data access as well. Um, then we have uh, the remote execution or the remote um, analysis environments. I put under this model the Australian Urban Research Infrastructure Network um, the, the, for geographic data access in particular. Um, the secure unified research environment produced by the Population Health Research Network um, is an example of um, uh, George's uh, uh, remote uh, access environment as well. And even data linkage facilities, um, another part of the PHRN uh, network fit to some degrees under this type of um, secure access model. Um, that's, a, in a sense, a, a more extreme version of that. And then we have other ad hoc arrangements as well. Things like the physical secure rooms, a number of institutions have a secure space. Um, there are a number here at ANU, for example. And then you might have other departmental arrangements as well um, that, that exist. Um, we can probably classify those in terms of the, the you know the distinctions in the type of approaches that, that, that we have. So what I've done here is just a very simple assessment from you know um, not at all to you know a very strong yes it can you know it fits within this sort of um, addressing this safe uh, element uh, from uh, from you know, from from low to high. Uh, I have some question marks on uh, some of the. Uh, uh, the facilities, particularly Shaw and the data linkage facilities, not because I don't think that they can do it, it's just like I don't have enough information to make an assessment there. Um, but if you look at the different types, things like the, the ABS models have tended towards um, safe data, so you know, the sorts of confidentialization and anonymization routines, data ch uh, output checking, and uh, secure access models. Um, and you know, tabulation systems are a secure access model as well. Um, They've tended less towards safe people and safe projects. So checking of people and checking of projects, we tend to put more, um, a, a lot of cases, there's more trust in the technology than there is in the people using the technology, which I think is a little bit um, problematic 
uh, given that there, are, and I'm going to talk to this in a moment, there are some fairly good processes in Australia for, for actually assessing the quality of people in particular and to some extent to projects. Um, so you know, this is, you know, we can kind of profile, the, po the point here I'm making is that different, you, know, you have different alternatives for how you might make sensitive data available. There's, there's not a one solution, it's you know, what are, you know, what's the mix of things that I might do and I'll come back to that at the end. So in the Australian experience, I say we have a strong emphasis on safe data. Um, we came up with the term in Australia called, of confidentialisation, that's probably the, the term you'll see more, most regularly. Um, in anywhere else in the world, it's, uh, you would hear the term anonymisation. Um, uh, I'm not quite sure why this is the case, but as I say, in, it, um, in Australia, the term is we, we tend to use confidentialisation. The Australian Data Archive used this model, the ABS, uh, and um, the Department of Social Services, things like the Household Income Labour Dynamics in Australia, use anonymisation techniques um, as sort of the starting point. So you, you can make data safe before you release it. Um, it has its limitations, um, and a, you know, a, a good example of that is some of the data sets were released into the data.gov environment um, used anonymization. Uh, safe data is the, sort of the priority. Uh, the potential for it to be reverse engineered, you know, if you haven't done your anonymization properly, then um, you have it, it could be reversed. Uh, and you get you know, a safe data risk. Um, so it, it has its flaws, and this is why we've tended towards looking at sort of a combination of techniques. Um, but as George pointed out, I say, if the risk of actually being identified um, um, is low, and particularly the harm that comes from that is low, then you know, there may be the case that, you know, that, that this is sufficient. Certainly a lot of the content that we have at, at ADA, most of our emphasis is actually on safe data more than anything else. Um, safe settings, um, we do have, as I say, examples here, a tabulation systems, you know, things where you can do cross tabs online, are, are, are fundamentally a safe settings model. People don't get access to the unit record data, they just get access to the systems to produce outputs. Um, Remote access systems, the, the research, Remote Access Data Lab, PHRN's Shore system, uh, and a new system that the ABS are bringing on, their Remote Data Lab. Um, they're making their data labs available in a virtual environment. Um, they're in pilot stages that we're working with them on at the moment, um, are increasingly uh, being used as well. Uh, they're also secure environments, as I mentioned, the, the data lab and the secure rooms. Safe outputs, um, a number of the safe settings environments, because they tend to use highly sensitive data, have safe output models as well. The real problem has been with these in scaling them. Um, it requires uh, manual uh, checking more often than not. Uh, so reviewing the output uh, of the, these sorts of systems, that requires people, that requires time. Uh, it's hard to automate as well. The ABS have invested a lot of money into automating output checking, point of fact. The table builder system is one of the best uh, that's around. Um, the, um, but the, the new remote lab still has manual checking of outputs. Um, so it depends on what you're trying to do and the sorts of outputs you're checking as to the extent to which you, uh, you're, sorry, the sorts of outputs you're producing as to whether you can actually automate the checking as well. The other side of this that I think will become increasingly relevant too is the replication and reproducibility elements of um, things that come out of systems like this. How are we going to facilitate you know, the replication models uh, within those environments? Uh, and I, I, I'm not sure that question's been addressed yet. Uh, safe researchers and safe projects in Australia, to be frank, they, they, they are considered in most models, but they're not really closely monitored. Um, and that's because they're difficult to monitor. How do you follow um, the extent to which people have followed the things that they've signed up to? Uh, anyone who's involved in reporting of research outputs for ERA or anything will know that getting people to actually fill out the forms, you know, in putting in place what I produced was, would be hard. Get, filling out forms to say, have I been compliant with a, with a data use agreement is even harder. Um, that said, um, we do have you know, you know, the, some checks and balances that are there, certainly in terms of the, the ethics models and the, code, the codes of conduct for research. Um, do provide some degree of you know, vetting insurance uh, for those that go go through that sort of system, uh, and you know that's it. That we we have 
some checks and balances in place for, particularly for university researchers, to address the sorts of concerns. So I think an emphasis increasingly on, say, researchers and projects might be one that we can we can leverage a bit more carefully. As I say, because of the frameworks we have in place, the straight the code of conduct, uh, and increasingly professional association and journal uh, requirements as well for data sharing. Um, are going to put a, a degree of assessment on the sorts of practices we use as well. The American um, Economic Association, uh, the DART uh, agenda in the political science, PLOS One's requirements for data sharing, these are actually a mechanism also for addressing partly you know, the extent to which, or by, by sharing, um, you know, assessing the sharing of data, you're also assessing the extent to which you're potentially you know, becoming disclosive as well. Uh, that, that's something to be, you know, to be considering in the future. I'll quickly turn to, to uh, the ADA model and then sort of, you know, and then wrap up. Um, so the ADA model, I say, our emphasis is primarily on safe data. Data is anonymised. Either we, it tends to be through the agencies that, that provide, or the researchers that provide data to us in advance. Uh, and we will also do some review on on, uh, on content as well. We'll provide recommendations back to our depositors as to, you know, these are the sorts of things you probably want to think about. Um, uh, in terms of have you included things like postcodes or occupational information. If I know someone's postcode, their occupation and their age, there's a fair chance that I can identify them um, uh, in many cases in remote locations in Australia in particular. Um, so there's some, some basic checks you can do. Certainly um, safe people and, 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 and safe settings. Our data access is all, almost all mediated. Um, you must be identified, you must provide contact information and supervise the details. So we do some checking on safe people and we provide information on project descriptions, what do you intend to do with the data as well, uh, particularly for where we have more sensitive content. Uh, often that's a requirement of our depositors. We don't apply, frankly, safe settings and safe outputs. That's not the space that we work in. Um, we work with other agencies such as the ABS, you know, where there's a, um, access to certain you know, sensitive content, we'll point people off to the relevant locations. Uh, and you know where you've got highly sensitive content that you know that you want to make available. Um, I say the, 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 uh, something like the, the remote data lab. Um, it, where is its focus? They focus less on safe data, so they're a virtual enclave. Um, they don't prohibit the use of safe data practices, so they do limit you know uh, where you have highly sensitive data. There's a more dedicated um, assessment process on the projects and the outcomes. Highly safe settings. Sitting at the ABS, the problem is that the, the cost they have is in establishing the system itself. Uh, they vet all of the outputs. It has, it, it has costs associated with it. Um, they have safe people. There's training for researchers prior to accessing the system. Um, the, there is some challenging in assessing the backgrounds of people, for example. How do you, this is where the need for domain experts. If you're going to fully assess people and projects and you're going to assess their domain expertise, um, you need domain experts to be able to make that sort of evaluation. So the emphasis might well be on the, you know, are, are you using appropriate te you know, techniques? Are you maintaining the you know, secure um, facilities? Uh, and are you, you know, potentially, you know, what's the research plan itself look like? Is more the emphasis than the quality of the science. Um, that's a much harder thing to, uh, to evaluate. Safe projects, um, that has been you know, used in some places at, at the ABS. Sometimes it's required for legislative reasons. The, the, the extent of data release is dependent itself upon um, meeting a public good um, statement, for example. Um, one of the questions for future for, for some organisations is should this matter? Basic research itself might generate useful insights that you didn't expect. So as I, in, in, in some cases, you, you again, you're going to be probably moving the levers. Um, Focus on different type aspects of the, uh, the, the safe data environment. Um, I guess the message we want to put through here is certainly there are sweeter options that are available for you for accessing sensitive data. Different models exist and they have different you know, ranges of the five safes. Um, you can certainly incorporate safe people models. Um, curious, a lot of models focus on the expectation we have an intruder. Hackers are coming in, in to access that system. Actually, what tends to be the case in, uh, more often than not is, is the um, the silly mistakes. You know, I made a mistake by leaving my you know my laptop on the train, um, or leaving my USB in the um, in the in the computer lab. That's far more common. Um, we have you know, so we tend to try and profile two default options. Um, what would you know in terms of our, our mix of you know safe settings? 
Um, but I say there are options available to you, and what you have to think about is what's appropriate for the form of data that you're trying to work with. Um, yeah, fundamentally, the argument is that principles should enable the right mix of safe for a given data source. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Steve. That was a really great overview about um, the different ways that the um, five elements of the SAFEs can be mixed and um, used in different settings. Um, I thought it was really interesting that both of you mentioned that um, a SAFE location was in a basement. <laughs> I've just got these images of people locked up in basements. Um, I also uh, wanted to note that um, George mentioned data masking um, and using um, de-identification methods and um, Steve also mentioned confidentialization, anonymization. Um, they're similar sort of words for similar processes. Um, ANS has a de-identification guide available on our website now, uh, so if you're interested in uh, that uh, some more detail on that information, we have um, that guide there that you can have a look at. And um, I was also um, wondering about, George, you were talking about um, with the data protection plan and the data use agreement that the onus is on the institution that if someone breaks it that they need to um, put them through some sort of research integrity investigation or something like that. Um, if that doesn't happen, is there any potential recourse for the university, like could ICPSR turn around and say, well, you didn't follow this process, you're not going to be accessing any of our data anymore? Sure. Actually, on our website, we we actually uh, list the levels of uh, escalation that we're willing to go to. And uh, we can certainly cut off the institution from, the, uh, from access to ICPSR data. But uh, the, what, is, what really gets people's attention is that uh, our, and the National Institutes of Health in the, in, in the U.S. has an Office of Human Research Protections. And um, if we thought that someone was breaching one of our agreements and endangering the confidentiality of uh, research subjects, I would report them to that office. That office has a lot of power. They regularly publish the names of uh, bad actors. What's more, they can uh, cut off all NIH funding to universities. Uh, and they have done that in the past when they thought that uh, protections weren't, weren't in place. So I always think of that as the nuclear option. And uh, I know for a fact that uh, university administrations and their uh, trustees and regents are terrified that NIH will, will do something like that. So just waving that in front of a university compliance officer gets their attention. Okay, excellent. Um, and Steve, I was wondering with your um, the Australian Data Archive, with the use agreement that mm -hmm. people are signing with that, is that with the individual user or with the institution as it with, is with it? Uh, primarily it's with the, ins uh, with the individual. Um, we have a small number of organisational agreements, but not many. Um, there is, um, I would say there's more efficient, uh, 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 yeah, uh, tending to focus on an agreement between the individual um, uh, and, and the organisation uh, rather than the, the organisation. Well, some organisations do ask for them, but frankly it's more actually for pragmatic reasons than it is for um, compliance reasons, um, is that they will want to host content uh, and manage access by you know, requesting access to a particular data set for all members of their research team, you know, for example. Um, so it sort of in, it just makes that easier, as it were. There are other other models. So uh, say the the ABS model is actually the agreement is with the institution, uh, and then individuals sign up to the the, um, uh, to the institutional agreement. Um, the Department of Social Services model is the same as well. Um, it would be interesting to see the extent to which we move in one direction or another. I'd say I, I think the compliance argument hasn't been one that's been all that common here in Australia. It's actually been, um, uh, except in the case of where you have government data, I would say it's probably the, the, um, the situation. But for you know for uh, academic um, produced data, that hasn't tended to be an emphasis. Okay, and uh, with um, George's agreement with. Uh, institutions where the you know recourse is that 
um, the institution should then have some integrity mm. investigation. Yep. What level of recourse do you have with the if the Limited. user agreement is with the individual? Limited. You know, I mean, you know, it, we would probably report back to the institution for which they, they belong, and that's as I say. So we do have this, the question about supervisory arrangements. We would probably also follow, you know, sort of the questions under the, the code of conduct for research. So that's why I sort of make reference back to there is an overarching set of obligations on yes. those within Australian African institutions, and we would pursue something in, you know, in that way. One of the challenges for us, and, for, and I'm going to guess for George as well, is just finding where you get breaches of compliance. One of the hardest things to do is actually find out what happened in the first place. Um, we've had one case that I'm aware of, in, well, certainly in my, my predecessor's um, lifetime, mm -hmm. um, which is yeah, uh, going back to the late 90s. Yeah. So it's, it's not a common occurrence mm -hmm. um, that we're aware of. But, yeah. Okay, excellent. So George mentioned standardised data use agreements between US institutions. Has that been formalised across a number of institutions as part of a consortium arrangement, or is it more of an informal and gaining momentum? Well, the example I gave is, is the Databury project, and they're the only ones I know that have done this in a formal way where they get institutions to sign on as an institution and and then that covers all of the researchers at that institution. Um, it took them a while to negotiate that and get the bugs out but it but I think it's it's paying off for them and this is something that uh, that I think uh, other groups like ICPSR should move to but right now it's it's a big problem that about one in six of our data use agreements at ICPSR involved a negotiation between lawyers at the University of Michigan and lawyers at, at the other institutions, so it's, it's a major cost. I, I think it's one of the ways to go. I, I would say that, I mean, in Australia we have a pretty strong example, which is the um, Universities of Australia or ABS agreement. I mean, that, that model facilitates a whole lot of things. Um, you know, so um, it, it's, say, it's sort of enabled access to the the, the broad collection of, of ABS curve data under a, under a single agreement. Now there is you know, universities sign up to a cost that comes with that as well, so they're paying a fee for that. Um, but that that let's say it covers the full spectrum of what they can do. The challenge in some cases is one you know what processing have you got for dissemination of the content? Um, as I say, if I went to the next department, I've had this discussion with various departments. Could we establish a consistent uh, data access agreement? Uh, and it's because the, the departments themselves are set up under different models, uh, under, different, under different legislation, sorry. The the impact of that is that they can't necessarily have the same set of, you know, conditions. Um, but certainly there is, you know, some, you know, capacity to, to try and harmonise some of that. Uh, and I'd be interested to see the extent to which the Productivity Commission report that's coming out of data access might address some of those sort of questions as well. Okay, great. Um, so just quickly, there's um, a question about are there any checklists or guidelines for new researchers to assess their research surveys for the level of confidentiality? So I think that they're talking about like privacy risk assessments. This is, okay, we have an internal checklist. Uh, this is something we've talked about in terms of thinking about whether you, um, what you need to do in terms, of, but it, it really depends on publication. We talked before about the fact that in order to do certain research, you need to have actually some things that might be identifying. Uh, so it depends on which point in the data life cycle you're actually talking about here. Um, it, when we're thinking about data release, um, then you say so we would basically apply some, some basic principles for these are the sorts of things that we look for. And actually we've talked about making that, that checklist available um, uh, in terms of these are the sorts of things you have to be concerned about. Um, there is advice around um, that we could probably bring together. Um, but and so the, it's this usability versus confidentiality question again. So one of the things we sometimes do is um, we split off those things that are, have a high confidentiality risk and we, and we actually release several different sets of data. Mm -hmm. So that if you need that additional information, you can actually make that available under a separate you know, additional set of requirements, uh, possibly under a different you know, technological setting. Um, so I, so I think it, it depends a little bit on when you when in the life cycle you are talking about here. Um, it often is useful to have as much 
you know, have information, particularly, for example, if you're running a longitudinal study, you must have identifying information going yes. forward. You can't be able to contact someone the next time around. Yes. Um, you know, it depends on what you're trying to achieve. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, there are, some, there are some basic advices that we can put out. And there's a literature that's been used by uh, statistical agencies about what they can release. But um, that whole area is, is right now somewhat contentious because the statistical agencies developed that literature largely in the, in the age when data were released in the form of published tables. When the data are available online and you can do repetitive, iterative uh, operations on them, you're in, you're in a new world and there's a, there's a, there's a separate literature um, that's developed from the in the computer science world. Um, and at any rate, it is a problem. There, there is guidance out there in, in really complex areas like in uh, some healthcare areas. Doing a full assessment of a data set can, can be very complicated and, 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 and difficult. So, uh, so I think, I mean, my recommendation is that people, you know, start at the basics and think about, you know, how would you identify this person and if this information got out, what, what harm would it, would it cause? Often the researchers themselves have a good sense, sense of that from the research they're doing. Okay. Just one last question. Are the five safes applicable in all research disciplines or are they specifically limited to the social sciences? I, I think they're probably applicable. I mean, I, as, I mean, it's interesting, we, we're having a discussion here about social sciences, but for example, um, we work a lot with health sciences, we work with environmental sciences and the like. Um, and, the, you know, it's, I, I don't see any um, reason why they shouldn't be applied elsewhere. I mean, that's, that's part of the question actually is, you know, it, it's more principles about what do you have to think about in terms of the privacy and confidentiality mm -hmm. risks, far more so than what's the topic. Yes. You know, the, topic, the topic helps you make some sort of judgment about the harm in, in, in George's terms, but, yeah, the, it's, it's, it's the confidentiality questions that are the ones that we're framework on. is still applicable. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Fabulous. Yeah. So thank you very much to George and Steve for coming along to our um, webinar today, and thank you, everyone, for calling in.